All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for joining us for uh, this webinar, New Year and New Financial Resolutions. So uh, today's webinar is hosted at, by the Maryland Smith DC and Northern Virginia Alumni Club and the Robert H. Smith School of Business Office of Alumni Relations. Um, I'm hosting today. My name is Abby Malko. I'm a 2017 MBA alumna for the Robert H. Smith School of Business. I'm also a member of the uh, DC Nova Alumni Club, and I know that there's other people in the club on the call today as well. Uh, I just want to give a couple housekeeping items before we get started. So the webinar is going to be recorded and it will be captioned. Um, we are asking everyone to please mute your audio line and disable your video. Uh, if you do have questions, as I'm sure you will, uh, we encourage you to use the chat feature to enter them or any comments you may have for the presenters. So with that, I would like to introduce our speakers for the evening. This evening we have Ben Offit. He's class of 2009. He's a principal at Offit Advisors. And then we also have Mei Xiong. She's class of 2012. She's a tax and financial advisor at Offit Advisors. So please welcome Ben and May, and they're going to provide additional information and begin their presentation. All right. Thanks, Abby. Um, and thanks, Mark, for helping uh, set this up. So um, appreciate everybody being here tonight. And uh, hopefully my, uh, my PowerPoint works here. It's uh, not going to the next slide, hang on. Here we go. All right, so um, our objective really tonight is just to, to help you and provide something of value. Um, hopefully you can work, learn something tonight of value. Um, one thing would be great. If you can learn many things, even better, but um, Really our objective at the end of the day is just to uh, provide some knowledge and insight that can be beneficial for you and your life and in 2021 as well. Um, I do wanna make a disclaimer. My son is not yet in bed and uh, it's coming close to being bedtime and uh, he's, he's 17 months old. So you might hear uh, some background noise of him like banging on the window with his teddy bear or something like that. So if that happens, sorry about that. Um, all right, well, here's our agenda for today. We just wanna give you a brief background on us and we wanna explain why issues persist on following through with New Year's resolutions. We wanna help provide a formula that can help you to solve that. And we wanna connect this formula and process with your own financial planning. Um, and then we wanna give you some updates on some new things in 2021, uh, some potential new tax legislation, student loan updates, and some financial hacks for 2021. So um, would really encourage you to stay through the end because uh, this is jam packed with information. And uh, I think it's some really helpful information uh, if you stay, stay through with it. Uh, so I think it's gonna be really interesting. I think you'll definitely learn something and that's, that's our objective. Um, we wanna make it interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to enter those in the chat. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm open, I think May's open that if you have a question, we can try to answer it as you enter it. Uh, we want this to be interactive, you know, not just a, a lecture, but you know, really conversational and just really want to help you. But we also have room for questions at the end as well. Uh, during the uh, presentation and the conversation tonight, we've got some TERP tests and uh, answer those, uh, participate. We'll have a winner uh, at the end, a special prize. So stay tuned for that, that'll be great. And uh, yeah. You know, we really just feel at home with you guys here tonight because May and I are both both Terps, so we're happy to be with other Terps and, uh, you know, Terps are our family. So, you know, we just want to help you guys, help our family members and, you know, make a difference for you. So uh, a little bit about me. I graduated in 2009. Um, I still, you know, can't believe it's been 11, 12 years. It really just rocks my mind. I uh, feel like it was just yesterday. I was, uh, you know, in college, but still have a great connection to the university and stuff like this is great that we can give back and, and help uh, help other Terps, like I mentioned. Um, I was in the Smith School and May was also in the Smith School. I was an entrepreneurship major. Uh, I also was in the Hinman CEOs program. So it was kind of like a, a double dosage of entrepreneurship. And um, you know, when I got out of college, I, I kind of just fell into this financial planning 
uh, business. Uh, it wasn't something that I intended on getting into. Uh, I knew I wanted to be entrepreneurial. I knew I wanted to uh, help other people, like I mentioned. I knew I wanted to have the ability to build a unlimited business. And uh, this opportunity really just came to light and I've uh, just ran with it over the last 11, 12 years. We've really invested a lot of time and energy into building this business. And, you know, a lot of the stuff we'll talk about tonight is really stuff we've just learned, you know, over the course of doing this every day for 11 and 12 years. And I think it's really valuable stuff that we'll try to teach you tonight. Um, so this is a picture of me at graduation day uh, with my, my two grandparents, on my dad's side. Um, you know, both also are Terps. So they met at University of Maryland. Uh, it's just a special picture to me. Uh, my grandfather is no longer with us, unfortunately, <laughs> but my grandmother is. And it was just great, you know, having them together uh, with me on that graduation day. And uh, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the University of Maryland, because that's, that's where they met. Uh, this is my wife and I, we also met at Maryland. And uh, this is about when my son was uh, a month old uh, last year, or I guess two years ago now in 2019. And this is us coming back uh, in September, walking around the mall. And uh, he looks a little bit disheveled there. Um, but, you know, my wife and I met at Maryland, like I said, and, you know, our son also wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for Maryland. So uh, definitely appreciative of that. And then this is just a cute picture, I thought, of my son and I, and uh, he's wearing a Maryland jacket and uh, just makes me smile. Just a cute guy. Um, all right, go ahead, May. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join our webinar today. Um, my name is May Zhang, and this is me about 10 years ago with my kids by my side, graduating cum laude with degrees in accounting and finance. So that is definitely one of the you know, proudest moments in my, in my life. Um, as an immigrant, I worked really hard supporting my family, uh, working and studying for time and, and landing a job with one of the big four accounting firms. Uh, as an advisor, I have been advising businesses uh, from uh, all sizes, uh, solopreneur to Fortune 500. Uh, uh, unlike Ben, I didn't go through the entrepreneurial program, but I um, really wanted to start a business when I uh, immigrated here, when I first landed here. I didn't know how, and it was like so many unknowns. I ended up uh, studying accounting and uh, finance. And um, now I support many entrepreneurs and business owners and um, help them to be more profitable and when the cash flows to uh, the employees and the owner's family i help them you know advise on retirement plans and their um, wealth uh, generation so it becomes like a full circle for me to uh, be this trust advisors for businesses and uh, owners and their employees I'm happy to uh, share some tips with uh, everyone today. All right, thanks, May. Thank you, Ben. All right, so um, you know, it's uh, what is it, January twenty seventh? Is that is that what it is? Or the twenty twenty seventh? Right. So approximately eighty percent of people who make New Year's resolutions have dropped them by the second week of February. So uh, that's coming up, and uh, I'm sure that's something you've heard of before, but it's true. You know, um, people come into the new year with lots of ambition and energy and excitement about the new year. And uh, they've got different goals, whether they're financial goals or personal goals, uh, professional goals, but usually you lose momentum starting around this time. So I think you just need to decide, are you going to be one of those people that follows through on what you want to get done uh, and make this year the year that you want, um, or are you just going to let it slide? So tonight we'll talk to you about some techniques and strategies to help you follow through in a productive uh, way. All right, so just a little bit of background about New Year's. Um, it really began with the Babylonians and uh, they kicked off this idea of New Year's resolutions. Um, it began with a 10 month calendar and March was the beginning of the new year. And uh, they, they started it with a festival to honor the gods 
and hopefully curry their favor for good crops uh, for the rest of the year. And then later on, Julius Caesar, the Roman emperor, um, introduced the 12 month calendar. And he changed it to January 1st as the beginning of the year to honor the god Janus, the god of beginnings. And this really is where this idea of New Year's resolutions began. Uh, the annual beginning, the annual opportunity to renew and have goals and get better through the year. So uh, that's just kind of the background of this, where this all came from. Um, there's something called the fresh start effect. And this is really just a psychological effect that I just alluded to that uh, gives people sudden motivation when we find, uh, you know, the beginning of the year is an opportunity to make changes in our lives. So you might be feeling that still, it might be starting to wear off, but this is kind of what people are experiencing right now. We just need to make sure that that follows through. All right, so now we're gonna reach our first TERP test. And remember at the end, uh, the winner is going to get a really cool prize. So let's start this first TERP test. Um, how many, I, I might have given away a little bit in the beginning, but how many of the of, uh, New Year's resolutions end up failing? So uh, Mark, do you wanna initiate the poll? Okay, great. All right, got a lot of votes coming in. I think we've got 76% counted. Got a few more out there. Okay, I think we got it. All right, so 60, oh, you're gonna, you can announce it, Mark, go ahead. Okay, no, great. So we had 62% that said 85% and 38% that said 75%. Okay, well, the majority of you got it right. Uh, not surprising, a uh, very smart group of Terps here tonight. So 85%, that's right. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of sad. That's kind of, you know, unfortunate, you know, that 85% of people don't have their resolutions, you know, come to fruition uh, and they end up failing, isn't it? You know, so what could we do to try to change that? What could we do to try to make that better? And um, it seems like my PowerPoint, here we go. Okay. So going back to you know ancient times and philosophers, this is a quote by Socrates. Um, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Okay, so it's not about fighting your old habits; it's about building your new habits. How do you build new habits appropriately? Um, what prevents progress and real change on following through with our New Year's goals? Well, number one, we try to change too much at once. Number two, we try to change a habit that's maybe too big, too audacious. Uh, and number three, we focus on the results instead of the actions to get there. So we're, we'll, we'll dive into these uh, more deeply, but those are the three main things that prevent people from following through and making real progress. So again, going back to what Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. Um, so we have a formula as to how you could follow through in 2021. So number one is start with why, you know, figuring out what this goal actually means to you on a personal level and an emotional connection as to why that's important. Because if that's not there, um, it might not mean that much to you to really actually follow through. Uh, number two, um, not make it too much or too big at once. Take steps, you know, one step after the other. Um, and number three, focus on smart activities, which we'll dive more into. If you can follow these three things and add them up, that will create your results. So let's just dive a little bit deeper into this now. So this is Simon Sinek, who many of you probably know. Uh, you can maybe consider him a modern day philosopher or a modern day guru. And uh, he came out with this a concept called Starting With Why, you know, very watched video and concept. And, um, you know, that really is just about, you know, understanding why things are important to you. You know, it's got to really elicit a strong emotional and personal feeling. You have to really desire it and why. It has to really, you know, hit you, you know, in the heart, you know, to really matter that, that much, you know, to Hi, make Paul. it. Um, if everybody could just mute, we've got some background noise there. So make sure you're muted. Um, but that's super important. And, and that's what Simon Sinek was alluding to. This is a, a picture of two gentlemen in the depression era. Uh, this is an era that my, my grandparents came from that I showed you a picture of earlier. And it's just showing you, um, you know, they might be out of work in that, in that time frame, uh, very desperate to find work and you know, make money to support themselves and their family. So 
you know, what I found with my grandparents, and I think a lot of, you know, you might also, you know, share the sentiment maybe with your grandparents or great grandparents or even parents um, that were growing up in that era um, is that, you know, maybe they're really focused on being frugal or they're focused on saving money or working really hard. And I think that comes from this emotional why of, you know, they grew up in a scary time or maybe, you know, they were out of work or their parents were out of work and they could barely afford to pay rent you know, or put food on the table, you know, so that became their why, you know, financially, you know, they don't want to go back to that time frame, So they do everything that they can to avoid that pain uh, that maybe they experienced growing up. So that, that's the example of, um, you know, finding a why uh, that's important to you. So step two, you know, um, not trying to do everything at once and, you know, um, making it simple, sim the simpler, the better and quantifying it and uh, breaking it into quarters, for example. So, you know, a fitness goal example might be in the beginning of the year, a lot of people try to have fitness goals and they say, well, you know, I wanna lose weight and I'm gonna start going to the gym every single day at five in the morning. You know, I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it every day at five in the morning. And that sounds great, you know, but then three days go by, four days goes by, you know, two weeks, three weeks, and they, you know, maybe start to lose that momentum lose that energy and maybe committing, you know, to every single day, uh, working out at five in the morning from not working out prior to that is a too big of a leap. It's just too big of a change all at once. Um, so what starts to happen is they start to lose that momentum and they gradually drift back into their older habits just because it was too much of a radical change um, at once. So, you know, what we're promoting, what we're saying is instead of trying to do too, too much at once, you know, maybe focus on something that's more sustainable or more, more accomplishable, if that's a word. Um, you know, um, maybe start with two days a week of working out um, or three days a week, or maybe not at five in the morning. And then you can work up to that over time. So taking bite-sized pieces and focusing on one step at a time is a way that you can do it. So this is a visual representation of that. This is showing someone trying to cross the Grand Canyon, uh, which is extremely scary, um, you know, on a high rope. Uh, I could never do this, but you know, this gentleman is able to do it because he's not focusing on crossing from one point to the other. He's not focusing on the Grand Canyon. He's focusing on one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, one foot after the other. And if you can do that, you know, that's the philosophy that we're you know, saying can help you actually follow through on what you want to get done. Um, and then you know, the final step here is smart uh, activities, smart goals. So um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but this is time for our, our TERP test number two. What does that actually stand for? So you've probably heard that acronym before, but what does SMART goals stand for? Is it A? Go ahead, you can read it. All right, we got 75% of the vote in. Let's see if we can get a little bit more in there in the next uh, 10 seconds or so. Okay, I think we're good. Mm -hmm. All right, we have 87% that say specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound, and 13% that say smart, measurable, actionable, real, time bound. Okay, let's see what the answer is. There we go. All right, smart crowd, obviously. Uh, so it was B, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. Um, but what's the problem with smart goals? Um, you know, I think the problem is we often fail to meet the SMART goals and it causes us to give up. You know, for example, if you create a goal, uh, a specific measurable, attainable, relevant time bound of, you know, losing 15 pounds by March 31st, 2021, and then you step on the scale that day and you've only lost 11, you know, you might say, well, I didn't hit my goal for my first quarter. I'm already off track. So, you know, forget the second quarter, I'm already behind, you know, and then you lose momentum. 
So instead of just focusing on the result of the goal, um, we're saying focus on the activities that get you to the goal. And that's really much more in, in your control. Um, let's not go into the next slide. Here we go. Um, so focusing on the action to get those results and doing the activity in support of the goal that you greatly desire achieving. Um, if you focus on what you really want and you stay accountable to those steps, that's what will help you to follow through. Uh, some research says that a habit can take 18 to 254 days to stick. So you really need to focus on developing habits and systems that can be repeatable on a daily basis. Uh, and that's what will lead to the results that you want. Um, also, sometimes we just need to trick ourselves to getting the results that we want by, you know, um, creating the and creating a, an environment or a situation where the only potential result um, is the result that we want. Um, so for example, you know, if you really wanted to lose weight, you know, one of the ways you identified you could lose weight would be to stop eating junk food, let's say. Just get rid of the junk food in your house. You know, just don't even keep it there. You know, don't let it in the house physically. Uh, and then there's no option to eat it if it's not there. So that's just an example of, you know, sometimes you, know, you can control your environment. Another example would be if you want to wake up at 7.30 in the morning, you know, it might be even too late, let's say 5.30 in the morning, um, but you always hit the snooze button. Well, is there something you could do to actually force yourself to get out of bed at 5.30 instead of hitting the snooze button, which is something that you're, you know, minimizing the, the, the purpose of the alarm clock, which is to wake you up. So let's say, for example, you had a coffee machine that went on the exact same time uh, or let's say a minute or two later, um, you know, after your alarm clock went off. So your alarm clock goes off at 7.30 and your coffee machine goes on at 7.32. And if you're not downstairs in two minutes, um, you know, the coffee machine, let's say you, you remove the pot, it's gonna go all over the countertop and you're gonna have to clean that. So that's like an example of something that would force you to physically get out of your bed and go downstairs and make sure you get up because otherwise you're gonna have to clean up that coffee pot every day. So sometimes you need to put in mechanisms that force you to get the result that you want um, by putting that environment and that structure uh, in place. So this philosophy and strategy directly correlates with money and finance. Now we're gonna to start to get into the money and finance stuff. Um, so let's try this together. Let's go back to our formula. So let's start with the why, because that's the first piece. You know, Figuring out why something is important to you, why it matters to you, it's gotta elicit that strong response. So think about, you know, where, you're, where are you now financially? Just really, you know, take a moment and really think about where are you right now uh, financially, okay? And where do you want to be financially, okay? And if you could rate that on a scale of one to 10, you know, where are you? You know, are you a five? Are you a three? Are you a seven? Uh, and what's between that number and 10, okay? Whatever is between that number and 10, uh, and you probably know what the reasons are, uh, that's the magic for you. You know, that, that's where you need to begin. Uh, that's what's most important because you know what's obstructing you or, or, or it's not allowing you to get closer to that 10 number. So that's really where you would start. Um, and you don't wanna be you know, vague about that. You don't wanna say, I just wanna be better with money in 2021. You wanna make this specific and you wanna add this to your why. So this is, a, this is an actual example that we got from a client of ours. So this person said, I'm a six. And uh, he said, in order for me to get to a 10, I need to save up $50,000 by the end of the year so I can buy a house in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, we said, well, why? You know, why, why do you need to do that? And he said, well, my dad is from Santa Fe and he passed away when I was nine years old. And I've always wanted to have a, a place in Santa Fe to feel closer to him. Um, so that's a very strong emotional response. And that really was important to him because he wanted to feel that emotional connection to his dad that passed away. So that's what we're talking about. You know, what, you know, why does that goal actually matter to you? So this person, you know, we were able to identify, you know, a very strong emotional reason. And then we were able to start to break that down into a not too big or not too much at once um, strategy to help this person get there. So they said, I have $26,000 now. I need to get to $50,000 by the end of the year. So therefore I need to save 24,000 this year um, or $6,000 per quarter, okay? So the first quarter measurable goal would be saving $6,000 um, in, in cash. So if we start to then break that down into smart activities, 
specific, measurable, attainable, relevant time bound, we could say, okay, you know, beginning of the year, you need to save $500 a week in order to achieve $6,000 by the end of the quarter. Okay. And that means you're on track to buy your house in Santa Fe, $24,000 save by the end of the year, but you're breaking that down to $500 per week. Okay. So, and then if you say, well, I can't save $500 a week, how do we figure that out? And then you can break it down further. And you can say, well, I could, you know, similar to that coffee example of not being able to wake up, you could put yourself in a position where you have to save that money. You could do that automatically. You could put it where um, that cash automatically transfers from your checking account to a house account, a separate savings account every single week. And it happens and you can't stop it, you know? So it's forcing you to get that result that you want. A great example of this is a 401k plan. Everyone thinks about saving for retirement, which is great. And that works very, very well because it's automated and it comes out of your paycheck. Um, but you can do that same thing for saving for a goal like a house. If you force the, you know, the result, I'm um, sorry, the activity that you want, it'll help you get the results that you want. So, you know, just diving down to this a little bit deeper, you could divide it up into quarters and you could say, you know, it, you know, I can't save the $500 a week yet, but in order to do that, first we need to clear up some credit card debt. And then we need to have a more cash, cash flow system, cash flow structure. We need to modify our spending behavior. Maybe we need to save some money on a student loan refinance. You know, maybe those are some steps that someone needs to take before they can even save $500 a week. Um, and that might be quarter one. And then quarter two, you know, maybe it's you know, creating a disciplined um, spending strategy where that person can only live on $250 per week, which allows them to save $500 a week. So you're forcing how much you're allowing them to spend. Um, you know, and then you can get it, once they've got that habit, you can get into other things like quarter three, reviewing investments or quarter four, reviewing education or insurance or other things. But it's about taking a step-by-step -step process that allows you to execute on these things. So going back to the finances, does this, you know, does this example meet our criteria of a formula? So number one, starting with why? Yes, this person had a very specific uh, emotional reason as to what financial goal they wanted to have happen and why they wanted that to have to, to occur. Um, number two, not too big or not too, not too much at once. Instead of focusing on saving 24,000 a year, they're focused on saving $500 a week and the steps that they needed to take to be able to save the $500 a week. And number three, focusing on those activities that correlate with that to get that done. That's what will equal the results, you know, that you want to have happen. And so, what we're saying here is, does this sound too simple? Um, if it does, that's good because it really should be simple, but it's about focusing on the execution of that simplicity that will help you drive your results. So um, it's really about, you know, winnowing it down as much as you can to what's controllable. You know, think about that example I gave a moment ago about, you know, focusing on that step, one step after the other to cross the Grand Canyon. Instead of focusing on one point to the other, it's one step at a time, one step at a time. Um, all right, so now it's time for TERP test number three. And uh, uh, Mark, let's do this one. Uh, what are some financial goals that you have in 2021? Is it A, uh, save more, B, pay down debt, three, invest more efficiently for growth, four, protect your future and your family, five, uh, save on taxes. Okay. Got about 65% in. And I hope everyone's staying tuned because we got a lot of more good stuff coming up. Uh, stay tuned. We got a lot of really interesting stuff coming up. Um, don't leave. <laughs> All right. We've got 88% uh, voted. Uh, go ahead, Mark. All right. Looks like our majority is 61% and invest more efficient, efficiently for growth and followed by a tie with pay down debt and save more. Okay invest more efficiently for growth. Um, that makes sense. Uh, we could dive a little bit more deeply into that, but you know, um, I, I didn't make a slide for this exactly because we weren't exactly sure what people would answer, but to invest more efficiently for growth uh, comes down to a few things. Number one, your asset allocation and your diversification model. So making sure that you have all the major asset classes in your portfolio, large cap, mid cap, small cap, international emerging markets, international developed markets, real estate, commodities, things like that that you're not overly concentrated in any one asset class because diversification proves that over the long term, winners and losers rotate. 
So if you're missing out on some of the asset classes, you're gonna miss out on some winners each year. And also controlling your behavior, not trying to time the market, not trying to chase after returns that have already been experienced that are already high. We're trying to sell out of you know, holdings that are down because then what you're doing is you're selling low and you're buying high. So um, instead you wanna, you wanna buy low and sell high. Um, it's, it's a second major tip about investing efficiently. And then a third major tip, the more exposure you have towards equities, um, instead of fixed income, um, the higher your returns will be long-term because equities historically produce much higher returns than, than fixed income and bonds. Uh, so the higher your allocation is that, the more your returns are gonna be long-term. Um, we can dive more into that if we have time. Um, okay, and let's see. All right, does anybody wanna talk, and we can you know, take a pause here. Does anybody wanna talk briefly about you know, any of their own financial goals? You know, we promise we won't bite. This is a very cute puppy here. Uh, we're like the cute puppy. We won't bite like the puppy. Um, if anybody wants to talk specifically about their situation, we can take a pause here. Just you know, go through any of their financial goals or your financial goals. And if not, we can keep going. Okay, we'll keep going then. All right, May. All right, the very scary tax topic. <laughs> Just wanna share a, a story. Many years, years ago, I worked um, briefly for federal government treasury. Um, I was helping them invest in hundreds of uh, millions of dollars. I had an aha moment and I realized the government didn't really want to tax you so much. Um, if you have better ways to manage your money, you know, if you are investing, if you are contributing to retirement accounts, government has so many uh, incentives for you to better manage your money. But if you don't, um, they will tax it. They'll reallocate your tax dollars. And we, we appreciate many of the things that governments uh, do for us. Um, but there are definitely instances of inefficiency, uh, you know, earmarking things that they might not be spending uh, efficiently for you. So we have now a new administration. Every time when we have a new administration, we'll have new tax laws. These are not aimed to like, um, you know, just to tax you for no reason. It is to fulfill some short-term or long-term social goals. So we don't need to get upset about it. We just need to plan about it. Um, you know, our nation now has growing deficit. It's gonna grow uh, even more because 2020, we've, uh, the government has been giving out PPP money and it's forgivable, uh, a lot of uh, stimulus uh, money. So, that's gonna grow, uh, it's gonna grow, continue to grow. Um, so the government will have to tax us more in the future to uh, fix the deficit. So on a Biden administration, we can potentially see the tax bracket uh, change. The high earners will probably have uh, close to 40% tax rate instead of 37%. Uh, That's what we have right now. And the social security tax wage right now, 2021, it's $142,000. That's gonna increase. That means you're gonna pay more uh, for social security tax. For capital gains, uh, right now our highest uh, is 20%, right? That is the, you know, if you invest in stock market, if you have rental property, uh, anytime you sell your, investment properties, you can have capital gains. Um, the new, there could be potentially increase, uh, the capital gain be taxed at um, highest, your highest uh, margin, could it be 40% or you know 25% based on your tax um, bracket. The estate tax, currently we are at uh, the exemption amount is $11 million. So that means um, if you leave uh, uh, asset worth $11 million to your offsprings, it won't be taxed. So in future, this could be lower. Could it be like, um, you know, 5 million, 3 million? So if you leave more than that to your offspring, the tax is gonna 
uh, it's going to be really high. And the step up basis, um, this thing, this matter is um, you know, if you inherit, inherit uh, properties um, from your loved ones when they die, your basis uh, currently is at a market value. So if the house, uh, when uh, you know, your great grandparents bought many years ago was uh, $100,000, now it's $1.5 million. You inherit it and you sell it you don't pay any tax because it's step up to current um, value. But um, if uh, the new law changes the step up basis, which will make you uh, uh, have the basis of your great grandparents, $100,000, and then you have to pay tax on that $1.4 million uh, of capital gain. Um, but um, there are ways to uh, manage that for sure. Um, there's a planning strategies to avoid all those um, tax hikes. Uh, just for example, social security tax, right? Uh, if you are getting close to $142,000, what you could do is you max your um, pre-tax uh, contributions, your 401ks, your IRAs, and your HSAs, which is for my medical, but could also be used for retirement once you are 65 years old. If you have, uh, as a W-2 uh, employee, you've maxed everything for the pre-tax um, and you could be trying for um, after-tax uh, uh, growth accounts. These, these growth accounts can be uh, tax-free uh, for, for the growth, such as cash value life insurance, and Roth account. Even um, for like a cash value life insurance, right? You, you purchase it and that's at with after tax dollars. But the growth inside, the cash value growth will never be taxed. And if you use it, you're not gonna be taxed or pay interest on that. Um, the Roth account, uh, it's even better. Um, Roth is such a, um, versatile account. Uh, even if you are not qualified for it, if you make too much money not qualify for it, there's a backdoor Roth, there's a mega um, backdoor Roth, which you can put in uh, individual account, traditional, uh, non-tax deduction at all, and then convert to Roth. And what happens is Roth will be never be taxed again. Uh, so if, you know, the deficit is growing, the government's are taxing higher and higher, and you can then, uh, you know, your Roth does not impact your tax at all. Uh, some people might, you know, take it for 1K count, uh, distribution, and that will actually impact their social security income, it might reduce that. And, um, but the Roth does not impact any of that. And it doesn't have a minimum requirement distribution uh, when you hit certain age. So it's really a flexible and very beneficial tool for you. Um, so, you know, if you, I know many people have all kinds of feelings regarding tax. Some are very fearful, some are stressed out. And you know, I know some of you here today might be excited for some refund, but um, if you have any questions and would like to ask for strategies for planning, uh, Ben, I would be happy to help you and design a, a plan for you. So uh, make sure to um, email us after the webinar. All right, great. Thank you, May. Um, all right, so in addition to tax planning strategies, we promised some financial hacks for 2021. So these uh, are going to be rapid fire. We're going to try to get into this as much as we can and, um, you know, just have, um, you know, probably about, you know, 10 minutes left about some really great ideas uh, that you could take advantage of this year that could make a big difference in your financial life. So number one, May just alluded to, you know, 401ks, but you really should think about maxing out your contributions if you can. From a cash flow perspective, nineteen thousand five hundred in a employer-sponsored retirement plan. This is a pure tax deduction. If you're over the age of fifty, you could do another uh, sixty-five hundred. Uh, those are catch-up contributions. Those are some of the best forms of uh, tax deductions uh, that are out there. Uh, number two, you can do it as soon as possible um, if your plan allows. So not everybody knows this, but if you've got a retirement plan at your job, some plans allow you to max it out 
sooner than 12 months. So if you've got good cash flow and your plan allows for it, if you can do it in the first three months or the first six months of the year, that allows you to get more money into the market immediately. And the sooner the money is invested uh, over time, the better it's going to do because there's more time in the market. Um, number three, uh, take advantage of the HSA. May mentioned that as well, but that's a health savings account. In 2021, if you're an individual, you can do $3,600. If you're married, you can do $7,200. If you're over 55, there's a catch-up additional contribution of $1,000. This is the only vehicle in the tax code that's triple tax-free. So you have a high deductible health plan, and then you save money to an HSA, you'll save money on your premiums. But again, you have to evaluate your health situation um, and see if it you know, makes sense for you and your health situation for this kind of health insurance coverage. But HSA vehicle you know, is a great for health related expenses, but also you can carry that over uh, the rest of your life and you can use that in retirement even as well. So it's another retirement vehicle in a way. Um, uh, consider refinancing your mortgage, your student loans, other debt. Uh, interest rates are very, very low right now. So this is an opportune time to do that. So if you got you know, a mortgage five years ago, if you even got it a year ago, uh, you potentially could be saving a you know, whole percent and more. Uh, on your mortgage right now. If you've got credit card debt, you could maybe refinance and you know, consolidate that with lower interest debt. Uh, student loans, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more deeply in a moment because uh, there's some interesting changes going on with that right now. Um, number five, consider an online savings account. You know, um, nothing against brick and mortar bank accounts, uh, banks, uh, but online savings accounts, even though interest rates are low, are gonna be paying a higher yield uh, than uh, brick and mortar. So if you want, if you're having cash in your bank account, you could be getting a higher yield, you know, but with an online account. So to consider that as well. Um, all right, number six. Uh, if you do have credit card debt, consider a zero percent interest credit card or a 401k loan. Uh, you know, credit card debt, you know, can be very high in interest, sometimes 10, 15, 20% plus. Um, if you can pay that down, that'll be the best rate of return you can find. Uh, it'll be better than you know even potentially saving money. And so you can pay down pay down something that's 18% interest. You're realizing 18% growth immediately by paying it off. It's not something that you're carrying on your balance sheet. So if you can do that by maybe shifting some of that to a zero percent card where you where you've got 12 or 15 months to pay it off instead of it growing at 18%, that's great. Uh, if you, if that's not an option, maybe you could consider something like a cash out. Uh, refinance on your on your house, where you can take out some of your equity and pay off the credit card debt. Or you can consider a home equity line of credit, or even a 401k loan, where you can take money out of a very favorable interest rate to pay off some debt. Um, number seven, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Re-examine your investments. Uh, equities are going to outperform fixed income in the long term. Um, there's a difference between risk and volatility. Sometimes people say, "Well, you know, aren't isn't the stock market risky?" And you know, we'll just try to clarify to them that it's not risky, it just has more volatility than bonds. If you can understand it has more volatility and when the market goes down, you don't panic, you don't change your, your, your approach, you stay invested, uh, you will be rewarded for that because you will have much better returns in the long term than cash or fixed income. Uh, number eight, May talked about this a little bit as well, but you know, love the Roth IRA. If taxes do go up, which we suspect that they will, you know, accounts that have no taxes on the back end of after growing it, like a Roth IRA or a 529 or a Roth uh, 401k, or um, you can even convert a traditional IRA to a Roth, cash value life insurance, all these things have tax-free, uh, you know, growth on the back end. So you never have to pay tax on it again. Uh, that can be very beneficial, you know, to your, your planning. Uh, number nine, you re-examine your, your insurance portfolio. If you haven't done that, you should do that once a year. You know, think about, am I getting the best prices, the best coverage for my auto insurance, for my homeowner's insurance, for my umbrella? You know, what about my life insurance? Have, my, have rates come down? Do I have enough disability income protection? These are all parts of the defensive side of financial planning. That's important to you know, evaluate at least once a year. Number 10, uh, consider an in-service withdrawal um, if your plan allows for it. So, um, there's different ways you can do this, but you know some plans allow if you're over the age of 59 and a half and you're still working, you can potentially move out your uh, contributions and your account balance to your own individual retirement account. This can allow you to have more flexibility, more investment options. Um, so that's an option to consider. Also may mention a mega backdoor Roth IRA. This is a more advanced strategy, but 
Uh, if your plan allows for it, you can potentially, even if you're over the income limit of Roth IRAs, you can make after-tax contributions to um, uh, a 401k plan and then move those out into a Roth IRA. Uh, you can potentially do up to $58,000 a year. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, and then we'll keep going here. Uh, we'll just try to go to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, number 11, start saving every month, even if it's small. You should be saving every month, you know, depending on what your goals are. You know, there's no, no, it doesn't have to be a huge amount. Just start somewhere and build up from there. Uh, number 12, scrub your subscriptions. I'm amazed at how many people don't do this because there's so many things to subscribe to nowadays. Um, you know, cancel the ones you're not using. It's just a waste of money. So really go through that. Um, there's a great, you know, app developed by University of Maryland, Hinman CEOs, Truebill. You know, use that app. It can tell you what, uh, what subscriptions you're not using and potentially cancel them. Um, 13, track where your money goes. You know, think about it. You know, where's my money actually going? Is it going towards something that is beneficial for me and my family and my future? You know, or am I just wasting it? You know, really just, you know, take a moment and think about what you want to have happen in your life, similar to what we talked about earlier and where your money's going. Um, uh, number 14, we talked a little bit about this as well. Make payments, even if small, on your highest interest debt. Your highest interest debt is your most expensive thing you're carrying. It's very hard to pay down at high interest rates. It's like, it's like quicksand. It's hard to get out of uh, if you don't pay it down. So really, you know, even if it's small, try to get that down and, and done as soon as you can. Um, and 15, I told you I was going to talk to you a little bit about student loans. So, um, you know, this kind of started with the CARES Act. Uh, in 2020 with, you know, some relief, but, you know, if you've got federal student loans, I'm not talking about private student loans, but federal student loans, those are, those were interest-free uh, until January 31st with the CARES Act. And now that's been extended uh, till September 30th of 2021. So um, that's a great opportunity. If someone's, if you have federal student loans and uh, you're considering public student loan forgiveness, if you qualify for that, um, if you work at a government institution or a school system, um, you know, you should, you know, think about maybe not even paying anything towards your student loans because uh, they're growing interest-free and uh, those months are still going to count towards the 120, 10 years of payments that you need to qualify for public student loan forgiveness. So that's a very interesting strategy. Um, if you have private loans, again, I'm not talking about that. We're talking about federal loans. Um, but if you do have federal loans, uh, and you're not eligible for public student loan forgiveness, you might not want to consider refinancing those right now uh, because you can pay them down at 0% interest. So that's a better interest rate than any refinance uh, right now. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, okay, and then just real quick, uh, we're wrapping up here, but you know, just wanted to talk about a few other things to not do in 2021. And um, number one, uh, don't listen to pundits that say they can predict the market because uh, they can't. Um, it's one thing to understand, you know, um, markets and how they work. Uh, it's another thing to make short-term market predictions. Uh, your investment decisions really need to have a longer-term outlook. And, uh, you know, these market experts really don't know exactly what's going to happen next week or next month or this year. So really focus on investing for the long-term, not the short-term. Number two, um, don't just invest into whatever the best performer was last year. So, um, you know, for example, large cap growth stocks did great last year, uh, but that doesn't mean that you need to shift your whole portfolio into that right now, because that's at the top of the market. You'd be buying, you know, really high if you do that. So, you know, in the long term, you'd be better by having a diversified portfolio, like we said, and focusing on buying low, not buying at the top. Um, number three, don't listen to your neighbors about, um, you know, how they've beaten the market and how smart that they are. Uh, if they are talking to you about how great they've done investing wise, you know, be skeptical because, you know, maybe they haven't calculated their return properly, um, or maybe they're not benchmarking it appropriately, or maybe they're not, you know, risk adjusting their returns, uh, or they could be just talking about investments they own right now, not the losers that they had last year or the year before that they got rid of. Um, so, you know, if you follow your neighbor's advice, what we find happens more often than not is you end up buying what's done well recently and you end up regretting it. Um, number five, don't diversify in the wrong way. So we believe, you know, don't necessarily just diversify financial advisors as a way to hedge risk. If you've got multiple advisors from multiple accounts, 
you, know, you can get conflicting strategies, uh, more fees overall. It's more complicated to track. Um, you might have unnecessary overlap in your securities. It might be more complicated with tax reporting, more difficult to organize if someone passes away. Um, so you know, just think, think through that. Uh, number six, don't procrastinate. This is what our whole presentation was about. If you've got things you want to get done this year, um, get it done. You know, create a plan to get it done. You know, take action on it this year. Don't wait to get life insurance. Don't wait to get your estate plan done. You know, if you've got a big stock position that you need to divest of, you know, think think through when you're going to do that. You know, start saving for retirement. You know, get it done this year. Don't procrastinate. Make this a year of getting things done. Number seven. You know, don't leave too much in cash if you have too much in cash. It's great to have cash, but cash is a very inefficient asset. And it could be costing you money by having too much of it in savings. So, um, you know, even though we talked about online savings accounts getting better yields than brick and mortar, if you've got too much cash in the bank, you know, more than you need, and it's earning, you know, half of a percent or 0% or 0.1%, and inflation's growing at 2 or 3%, you're losing 2 to 3% a year. So, um, you know, be cautious about having too, too much cash. You might want to put more of that money to work for you if it's just sitting there. Um, and number eight, you know, just don't do stupid stuff this year. Don't go on a whim and just go buy a ton of Tesla stock just because you think it's the best stock to own or leverage ETFs or don't just go day trading on a whim and, you know, buying a ton of Bitcoin, you know, be smart about it, be reasonable, have, you know, sound decisions, think it through, think for the long term, you know, don't just go buy a bunch of things on credit cards, just be smart this year. Um, you know, so those are some of our top things to do in 2021 or not to do in uh, 2021. And uh, all right, we're making it through to the end. And, you know, you guys stayed. And we told you we'd have a prize for everybody that stayed through to the end uh, and that, you know, uh, answer the question. So here's our prize. Um, this is a great video. It cracks me up every time I watch it, puts me in a good mood, puts, puts a smile on my face. This is your prize, okay? Uh, enjoy. How can you not love, you know, some goats dancing to some, some funky music? I mean, that's it. That's the best prize I could imagine. Um, all right. And then we're going to wrap it up by saying, you know, have a, have love in 2021. Uh, last year was really difficult. This year has been difficult, but you know, our belief, you know, my personal belief is to focus on love, right? Make the world a better place and uh, have love in your life. And at the end of the day, if you can spread love and spread positivity, uh, you know, that's really what we're, we're here to do in life is, is my belief. And money is one thing, but money at the end of the day, is just, it's just money. It's just a conduit for your personal objectives and your goals. So money really can be a conduit to, you know, helping you achieve your life mission and your life objectives for yourself and your community and your family. So really think about that. That's really what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, and then lastly, you know, here's our contact information. You know, let us know how this was for you, if this was good or bad, things we could improve upon or do differently. Uh, here's our information. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, hope this was helpful. We want to help other Terps. And we, we've got some time for questions, I think, a little bit if we if we do have any. Yes. Oh, thank you, Ben and May. I was taking so many notes. I feel like there's always something to learn when it comes to finance. And taxes are always depressing. Um, okay, so I know we only have six minutes left. So Mark, I know that there's a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so I'll probably have to defer to you on what was not answered. Sure thing. So we have, um, I know May, you were, we had a couple questions from Cynthia and May was responding. And Cynthia, I don't know if, if your, answer, your questions were answered. If not, um, let us know. Um, did you get what you needed from those two questions? There's a question on pre-tax raw salary and then another on um, monies into, putting money into a CD instead of a savings account. I think your question might've been answered by May. Both of those questions were answered. If not, we'll come back to those. Um, but David had a question on number two of the financial hacks. If you don't contribute somewhat smoothly to a 401k throughout the whole year, you, you lose company match for the pay periods of zero. Okay, reasons. great point. That's a very important caveat as well. So each plan is different. So you need to make sure that if you're going to do that strategy before you do it, great point, that your plan will still match. Uh, not every plan does. So 
if your plan will continue to match, even though you front load the contributions, then it makes sense to do it. If they don't, it doesn't make sense. Perfect. Okay. And then the app that you mentioned, was that true bill? Yes. Okay. And that's, you said was used, connected to UMD or a UMD and alum? Yes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And those are the main questions. Unless Cynthia, unless we didn't mention, can Ben and May share your email addresses? Yes, I'm going to type my email. Okay, perfect. Got it. Thank you. Um, what I, I will repeat Cynthia's question just in case it wasn't um, answered since we have a couple minutes. Um, our company allows both pre-tax and Roth salary deferrals for 401k. While pre-tax reduces taxes have to pay now with the low tax, <laughs> it's better to use a Roth salary deferrals to go ahead and pay taxes now. And is there any advantage to doing half pre-tax and half Roth post-tax for a 401k? Um, yeah, I would say there is a benefit to that. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we think taxes will go up in the next few years because of everything may went over. But long term, you know, if you're planning to retire and using this money in 20, 30 years, we don't know what the tax rates might be then. They could be lower in the future. They could be higher in the future. So if you want to hedge that, you could put money into the traditional and the Roth, you know, kind of take advantage of both worlds where you're getting some deductions today and then some tax-free growth on the back end. So um, yeah, you could do that. Okay, perfect. Um, and then the second one she had was, is putting money into a CD instead of a savings account of any value these days? It seems like interest on savings account is basically nothing and wasn't sure if CDs may be somewhat better to put some savings into and letting those grow. Not really. I don't think CDs have much better interest than savings accounts. I'm not a big fan of CDs, um, you know, because it's really just locking your money up with a low interest rate. I don't see the point of that, you know, with a savings account, your money's all liquid, you know, so you can take it out anytime with a CD, you might have to pay a penalty. You can't touch it for, you know, a year or two years or three years. And if you're locking it up in a low interest rate environment, it's just not, you know, it's not that beneficial to you. You'd rather keep it liquid and, you know, keep it available for you know, something else, I think. All right. Thank you. That's my the last questions. So we're all set. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Hope this was Turn it back over to uh, to Abby. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be reaching out to you, and and thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, so I guess this concludes our session. And and Mark, you're going to send out the recording. I take it. Yes, we'll post it on our webinar website. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Email us. <laughs>